Today, we're going to hear from a couple of our church planters. Uh, we've been working in planting churches for maybe about 15 years now, and currently there are six church planters that, that City Lights is working with. We're going to hear from two of them uh, today. We're going to hear uh, from Tim Hutchinson, who is planting a, a church uh, among unreached people groups in, in Irvine, and he's going to be sharing a, a short devotional about Easter. And then we're going to hear from Evan Dahl. Uh, Evan is planting a network of house churches uh, in uh, Santa Ana. So it's really exciting to hear from them. And so we're going to hear from Tim Hutchinson and Evan Dahl. Good morning, City Lights Church. My name is Tim. I'm a church planner and missionary here in Irvine. It's a joy to be with you here on Resurrection Sunday, the day that we celebrate Jesus rising from the dead. And if you're anything like me, you know, when we hear about Jesus rising from the dead, it's, it's something that's, you know, maybe very familiar. And I think familiarity can be a very good thing or can be a bad thing. Um, for example, uh, my, my wife and I, we are not from here in California. And we moved here four years ago. But when we moved here, we were just blown away by how close we were to the beach and uh, getting to see the ocean and seeing the sunset over the ocean. And we were just like, wow, this is amazing. But over time, you know, we kind of lost maybe focus or maybe we lost the, the, the oddness or the beauty of, of something like going to the beach until like when we have our friends or our family who are visiting from, from out of state come and visit uh, we, we always want to take them to the beach because they don't get to experience that. And it's really cool to see, you know, their oddness or their wonder of the beach, you know, seeing it maybe for the first or, you know, maybe seeing it for, uh, like it, it's something that's new for them. And so when we get to witness them, it almost reminds us of, of how awesome this is. And, that's the beauty of, of some of the stuff that we get to do here in California is we, is we are working with people who uh, have little knowledge about Jesus, who maybe have never even heard of Jesus before. And so getting to see them discover who Jesus is, is a really refresher for us and for our family. It's a great reminder to see Christ in his beauty and to see him in a new and fresh perspective. This recently happened with, uh, with our friends from, from China that we were studying the Bible with. We asked, do you know who Jesus is? And they, they really didn't know who, who Jesus was or what he had done for us. And so we started studying scripture, starting going through, through scripture. And, you know, we get to the story of, uh, of Jesus' death, his sacrifice, and they were blown away. They're like, wow, Jesus is so humble. You know, he is, he is so kind. Uh, like his sacrifice cleanses us. It gives us hope. And we're like, yes, you know, you are, you are so right. You know, thank you for reminding us of this truth as well. And we started to study the, the resurrection and they had some questions. They're like, is the resurrection that important? You know, is it um, like, like what's so significant about the resurrection? And we're like, well, let's, let's study scripture. Let's see what scripture has to say about the resurrection and the importance of it. And so we took them to 1 Corinthians 15. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. And as we were communicating the gospel to them, we, you know, we we're talking about, you know, how it says that, that you must believe in, in, in the death and resurrection of, of Jesus and, and you will be saved. And in 1 Corinthians 15, it talks specifically about the importance of the resurrection. Paul says, and starting in verse 14 says, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. And skip down to verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. You know, if Christ did not raised from the dead, then we do not have any hope. Then we do not have any assurance. I love the verses in, in, in verse in first Peter verses one or chapter one verse three says, 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. How do we have, how do we have this newness of life? Well, it's through the resurrection of Jesus. And when our friends from, from China, when they were discovering Jesus and when they, when they learned about the resurrection, they were like, this changes everything. Now, this changes how, how we see God. This changes how we view Jesus. This changes, you know, our, our lives. And they're 100% correct. You know, Jesus in, in the Gospel of John says that he is the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in him will live. And so since Christ has rose from the dead, we have life. We have hope. We have assurance. We have comfort. We have joy. We have this peace. And we, and we know that our faith, our message is meaningful. And so church, I just want to, to challenge you uh, to, to view Christ in a fresh perspective today, to view him uh, like a, like a, like a child, you know, have that childlike faith and let us rest assured in this hope of his resurrection. Let us rest assured in the promise and of the truth that we will have life through him. And let us deliver this message of hope to those who are around us. Amen. Well, happy Easter, everybody. My name is Evan. Uh, it's an honor to be with you uh, and to be with just all of us as God's big family as we celebrate Easter today. It's a huge day uh, because this is the day that we come together. Again, as a family uh, of, uh, of Christians, a family in Christ to celebrate the biggest event really in the history of mankind, uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He conquered death and he gives us hope for new life. And so that, that is so, so awesome. It makes us family automatically and it gives us reason to come together and celebrate. I'm honored to uh, just read the word of God with you this morning. We're going to be taking a look real quick at John uh, chapter 20. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to frame this uh, under, uh, I'm going to take a look, at, in other words, at Mary Magdalene's story. Okay, so we'd like to look, uh, if we were to look at this little vignette of Mary Magdalene's story in the empty tomb. Uh, but would you do something with me? I like, to, I like to pray when I'm interacting with scripture. Uh, and I like to pray together as a body uh, because I believe that truly we are going to encounter Jesus in this scripture and that the Spirit is going to remind us of, uh, bring us into all truth and remind us what he said and speak to our hearts individually and collectively. So let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. Uh, wow, just for conquering death, that you are the God of life and that you want to give life to our community. You want to give life uh, to us individually and in our families and in our homes, God. So I pray that you will just saturate us with your joy uh, that, that, that you are alive, that you have conquered sin and death, and that we can walk without shame, uh, without uh, any of these other voices that may be in our heads constantly. Uh, battling against us, God. You are for us, and I thank you for this scripture. I pray that you'll speak to us and, and just give us that joy and that hope that we have as we move forward in 2021 uh, together and with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, John chapter 20, uh, we're going to start in verses 1 and 2, and then we're going we're gonna to skip over Peter and John's reaction. We're going to follow again uh, what Mary Magdalene has encountered. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb, while it was still dark, this is Jesus' tomb, and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, that'd be John, and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stood and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord. I don't know where they've laid him. When she said, had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know what, that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? 
Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you, have car- if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Okay, let's pause there for a moment. I want us to observe uh, Mary's posture through all this. Obviously, she was very devoted. This, this had been, well, kind of a bad weekend for her, right? They crucified, they slaughtered, they killed her Lord, her teacher, uh, Jesus. And in, a, in a, the most brutal way possible, they buried him away in a tomb. And so she had gone down uh, a couple mornings later to, to go just be with that body. And she was weeping and weeping and weeping. And we know why from verse 13, the angels ask, well, why are you weeping? Right? And she said, because they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. Okay. All of her hope had been set in Jesus. The one thing that had redeemed her, the one thing uh, that, that loved her, that filled her with joy, that completely changed her life. And all of that had been taken away. Now, in a similar way, okay, a lot of us have been weeping <laughs> through this last year, and there's a little bit of a hope as we're kind of coming, hopefully, out of a pandemic, a global pandemic. And there's a lot of questions that are now arising through the whole, uh, through the whole pandemic, the whole last year, year and a half, of, of what does church really mean? What does it really look like? Is God really in charge? People have had many things uprooted and upended. God has, if you will, tilled the soil of the earth, where maybe once everything was as planned, uh, you go to church, you show up at your job, you meet with a friend, but perhaps all of that had been taken away from you in the last year. And so you may not be standing there right now physically weeping and crying, but certainly our souls are weeping deep down. And what we're looking for was what was once there, right? There was, while everything was taken away, again, it was a very traumatic weekend for Mary, but at least she knew, okay, well, this is the final resting place of Jesus, and so I'm going to go there where I normally go. For many of you, it's been very confusing, especially if you're used to attending a, a church and, and being in the building and being with, in fellowship with others, and it's always a great feeling, and maybe that was all stripped away. And maybe, just maybe, God had done that, Uh, to, uh, again, till the soil and prepare for something else. And this is actually what Jesus was about to do, as we'll see in a moment. But I want us to pause and just consider the question that both the angels and Jesus had asked Mary. Why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? And Jesus takes it a step further, if you notice. She says, well, I'm weeping because, man, I'm looking for something. We're still looking for something. We're looking for answers. We're looking for, well, how are we going to get back to where, where it was and how things were? But Jesus asks something a little bit different. He says, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? See, Mary's looking for a thing. She's looking for a body. Just something that could physically remind her that, oh yeah, that one time that God did this amazing thing in my life and I just want to go to this memorial site and see a thing, a tomb. But Jesus says, whom are you seeking? And this is a different question because he's not asking what thing are you looking for, i.e. a body. He says, who, a person, are you seeking? And again, she says, if you've taken the body away, I'm still looking for this thing. I want everything to be back the way it was. But Jesus is saying, ah, well, if you're looking for that, you won't find it. Because he, not a thing, not the body, but I, a person, am alive. So let's see what he says next. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Now in just one verse, things go from crying and weeping and mourning in the bitterness of her soul to suddenly this elation and this joy. I'm reminded uh, just the other day as I was uh, preparing this, how my son, one of my sons came downstairs not knowing where I was. He was a little bit scared and he's like, I heard, I heard his little uh, whimpering of like, mm-mm, and, and I came out of my office. I'm like, Georgie, you know, my son, George. I'm like, Georgie, I'm right here. And as soon as I said his name, he, his eyes turned all blurry and he, he ran over and gave me a big hug. And there was this sense of security and relief that, oh my gosh, he's here. There is somebody here. And in the same way, you can imagine Mary just 
elated. That term Rabboni uh, in the Hebrew, uh, usually you'd say rabbi, which just means teacher, but Rabboni is this term of endearment, and it's this dear teacher. But it all started with uh, Jesus, who was right in front of her, by the way, although she didn't recognize it, who turns and says her name personally and in such a way that she knows to her core that mm, this, this is him. Only Jesus would say my name like that. Are we able to pause for just a moment and hear what God is actually saying to us in the midst of all of this that's going on, in the midst of curiosity of what, is, what the future is going to bring, of what the church is going to look like in the future, of what my life is going to look like. Some of you have lost people. Some of you have lost jobs. Some of you have lost plans. But listen to Jesus' question, whom are you seeking? And secondly, listen for him to call you personally, because he will. And in such a way that your heart is captured. And that is what Jesus does, because we're not just looking for a dead body, a religious memorial. We're looking to seek together a risen person who has conquered all of that. And finally, look what happens after that. Now, you can imagine after this personal encounter, this little moment of just hearing her name, was all it had to do was just turn her completely 180. Look at what happens next. Okay, we, we know what she does. Okay, she's, she's grabbing onto Jesus, like for sure, right? Because she says what? Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, right? Like she's like, grabbing, like, no, I never want to let you go again. But Jesus says, ah, oh, okay, now hold on. He says, stop clinging to me, okay? In other words, well, calm down. And, For I have not ascended, yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and announced to the disciples that I have seen the Lord and that he has said these things to her. Okay, we want to hold on again. We want to hold on and grasp on like, yeah, Jesus, yes. But he actually says, hey, I know, I know. But I'm actually going to do something greater. So things may not be the same ever again, but they're going to be better. We know that because Jesus did ascend to the Father and is sitting at the right hand of the Father, says the scripture, and that he sends his spirit into the world and that he is still alive and very much on the move. But it takes a certain recognition because again, was Mary a believer? Absolutely. Did she love Jesus? Absolutely. Was, was, was he her Lord and Savior? Absolutely. But she just didn't recognize that he was right in front of her until he said her name. And maybe that's where we're at as, as a church, right? Together we need to listen for Jesus to call us once again and to recognize that we're not just looking for something. We are always on the look for someone who is alive and active and in us and who sends us to say that there are still yet greater things coming. And I do believe that there are great, great things coming. Again, God has tilled up the soil. He's broken up the dirt through this worldwide pandemic. But a good farmer knows that you till up soil right before planting seeds. So again, he is addressing pain. He is asking us, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And then he says our name and says, now go and tell others that I'm about to do some great things. You know that I'm alive because I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And he, he, he sends us back out into this world that is broken and looking for something that is dead and gone. And we are to announce that, in, that he, a person, Jesus, is risen and he's risen indeed. I really appreciate uh, these two guys. Uh, we meet together all the time. We're in a cohort together. Uh, I'm in the. Um, I'm taking them through this year-long training process, and. Um, helping them plant the churches in their communities. Uh, I wanted to just end uh, with a, a quick word of, of um, encouragement. Easter is an amazing event. Easter changed everything for the people who witness this. They, they changed, their lives were totally changed. Those people who saw Jesus after he rose from, from death, their lives were never the same. It, it changed, um, it took their grief and turned it into joy. It took these people who are scared and frightened and gave them boldness. It, it took a divided 
group of people and united them into the church. Uh, it took doubtful, scared disciples, and, and then they became these uh, surrendered worshipers committed to the cause uh, of, of the gospel. And I just want to tell you, the resurrection has amazing power to change lives. The resurrection changes everything, but not for everyone. Because there, there were some people who witnessed the resurrection that they, they weren't, weren't changed. And it's interesting, in um, Matthew 28, uh, 16 and 17, this is right before the Great Commission. Uh, it, it, this is the last time Jesus was appearing to his disciples. He appeared uh, to them in resurrected form for about 40 days. And this is the last time. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to the Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. They worshipped him, but yet some doubted. And it, it's interesting that these were all, quote, they're all followers of Jesus. All these people follow Jesus. They, they obey Jesus to go and meet them at the place that, that he told them to meet them at. And during this time, this was an unpopular time. Jesus had, was just killed and they were scared. But now, now they're following. I mean, these guys showed up. So they were, they were followers, but they were still doubtful. They were doubtful followers. And maybe you can relate to that a little bit. I know I have, have had seasons where I've been a doubtful follower. But it says there were some that fell down and they worshipped. It says when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And the question I have for you is what type of follower are you? These are all followers. Are you a doubtful follower? Or are you a surrendered worshiper? Because it's those people who, who recognize who Jesus was that surrendered to him. Because the words that came next from Jesus' mouth was the Great Commission. And he, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all I have commanded. And surely I am with you till the end of the age. And and we see that these people who were surrendered worshipers, they recognize the authority of God. They recognize the resurrection caused them to recognize God's authority. So when Jesus says, all authority has been given to me, they're like, um, yeah, we won't argue with you anymore. We're surrendering to your authority. But not only that, they, at that point, they embraced God's assignment for their lives. And it's, it's not only enough to follow Jesus. You have to surrender to God's authority and by surrendering to his authority, it also means that you're embracing God's assignment for your life. And here, the assignment was to go and tell all nations about, about what Jesus has done. Go and spread the good news. And I just want to tell you, the power of the resurrection is available to you and has the power to change your life in a radical way that Easter changes everything. The resurrection changes everything, but not for everyone. There were some that still chose to doubt. And I want to implore you, like, don't be a doubtful follower. Don't be a, you got to learn how to be a surrendered worshiper to, to recognize his authority and to surrender to his authority and then to embrace his assignment, because that's the thing that's going to change your life. I just want to tell you, he has risen. He has risen indeed. Do you believe that? Do you truly believe Jesus was risen from death? And if you do, it's time to not just follow. It's time to surrender and to embrace his assignment for you. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Let me pray for us. Father, help us to be surrendered worshipers. We come before you and we want our lives to be changed so that we can serve you and be useful for you. Use us to bring you more glory, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.